The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and religion. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Herb Boyd, author, journalist, writes for the Amsterdam News. <laughs> Everybody knows Herb. Yes, indeed. Thank Glad you. Glad to have you with us oh, today. It's a pleasure, Roscoe. Now, you've been writing for the Amsterdam News for a long time. Mm, and 22 so, years now. And so, therefore, <laughs> you've seen the changes in Harlem yes. all these years. In your opinion, what has been the most significant change in Harlem over these 22 years you've been writing? Obviously, uh, the uh, whole discussion now with the changing demographics, the kind of uh, the on push, the on uh, surge of gentrification cer certainly has been something that is pretty obvious. You know, you mm -hmm. can see that. I know I moved into Harlem for the third time in 1985. And um, in 1993, I moved from 148th Street, along with my wife, to 146th Street. And when we and arrived... Where, near what happened? This is all Sugar Hill. Okay. This is all Sugar Hill, now, you know, between Convent. Yeah. Those <laughs> who are not the Congress Center, let's right, tell right, us right. about <laughs> Sugar Hill, where it's located. Let's break it down. Let's hurt. break it down. Let's, uh, it's uh, uh, St. Nicholas and Convent are the borders for me. But Sugar Hill is like, you know, you go up uh, Bradhurst and Edgecombe, you get to the top there. Really, really the top, I think, is Amsterdam yeah. when you get to the top. And you go from 145th up That's to right. 155th. Oh, about 155th, yeah. yeah. So that whole area there is considered like Sugar Hill. Uh, I was tracing Why the history. Why was it called Sugar Hill? That's exactly what I was thinking about. Uh, two writers that I've dealt with over the years has been Sugar Ray Robinson. I uh, did a biography of his life, and most recently, James Baldwin. Mm -hmm. And, of course, looking at the life of James Baldwin, you have to talk about Langston Hughes and a few other writers, County Cullen and Billy Strayhorn, mm -hmm. and the musicians over the years, the Sonny Rollinses and the, uh, and the uh, you know, the uh, uh, Jackie McLean. Mm -hmm. All of them used to make reference to Sugar Hill. So I would say, well, what do you mean by Sugar Hill? The rest of it was pretty salty. Mm -hmm. Well, I think they were making some kind of class distinction, mm -hmm. Roscoe, because that was where the elite lived, and it was nice and sweet to live up there. Mm -hmm. The late Howard Stretch Johnson broke it down mm -hmm. for me. He says that there was a time, of course, you know, in this community when it was all white up there. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, blacks began to kind of trickle in. But they came up out of the hollows, out of the valley, out of mm -hmm. central Harlem, Imagine. up the hill, you know. Mm -hmm. so that's 1950s. You still talk about 1940s. largely a white community, yeah. you know. So he said, well, that was sugar meant that it was mighty sweet to live up there. Mm -hmm. You know, it was the housing. I mean, you look at Hamilton Terrace. Yeah. And it continues to be very, very luxurious yeah. there compared like Strivers Row. Of course, that's down the hill. Yeah. So I live on the hill now. The folks yeah. who live on the hill, I live on the hill. Now, as Harlem has changed mm -hmm. due to gentrification, what has really been, the, is it a demographic change in terms of race or economics or class? How has it changed? And how much has that changed? Because mm -hmm. I recall uh, back in the 70s, 8th Avenue, uh, Frederick Douglass Boulevard was mm -hmm. practically abandoned from 110th all the way up to 125th Certainly. Street. Exactly. And if you ride there now, you see all these beautiful oh, new buildings oh, and yes, so on. Yeah. So how has it really changed in terms of demographics? Well, I think that's one of the things. It's a mixture of all those components you mentioned uh, because you certainly have and when you talk to people about these changes going on, you ask them, how do you feel about it? And I've done my informal surveys, mm -hmm. and I've looked at some of the more formal surveys out there, too. And you get mixed, uh, mixed reviews on that, Roscoe. Some feel that they welcome this whole change. Of course, change is inevitable. It's they welcome the change for more white people or more, more economically a, powerful people? class standpoint. A, uh, the race standpoint, the people who coming in obviously is going to be a class factor based there because if we talk about gentrification, that means that some people are going to be moved out, displaced, while that property is renovated. Mm -hmm. And with the renovation, of course, the property is going to be improved sometimes to a level that's almost prohibitively high mm -hmm. for the people who formerly lived there. Mm -hmm. So you have exorbitant, uh, you know, rents and uh, house notes and what have you. So that limits the people who actually have opportunities to do so. Yeah, on a previous program, I was talking with Paula Wilson yes. with the HCCI, mm -hmm. and they have programs to educate people about how to get mortgages and how to avoid predatory lending. Yes. Um, and many of the buildings initially, 
in the revival of Harlem where the city owned buildings. Yeah, One time the sure. city owned about 60% of the real estate exactly. in Harlem. And they set up various programs beginning with Ed Koch to make it available for community groups and for developers. Mm -hmm. So that uh, those vacant buildings, many of them were rehabilitated, many of them were torn down. So now you have certain buildings where I read in the paper the other day that they're selling a, a condominium oh, for $1.5 million on exactly. 129th Street. Hey, for and one bedroom. <laughs> one one bedroom. But anyway, now, you are a journalist mm -hmm. and a writer. Uh, wh what do you see in terms of the impact of this on the traditions and culture of Harlem? Well, many people are fearful that with this here changing demographics and this onsurge of uh, gentrification that it might impact the kind of cultural spirit of the community. How? Well, I think that because you call the, the influx of new cultures coming in, and I think people are talking about the more Eurocentric cultures coming in that might dilute that Afrocentric base. Uh, I don't think well, that's going to happen. Let's be fair about it. Yes. A lot of poor people in the old Harlem mm -hmm. didn't have the resources to enjoy the cultural base and the cultural factors there. They didn't, so, but they fed it though. So, pardon me? They fed it. They fed, they mm -hmm. fed it and mm -hmm. they felt it. Mm -hmm. the, the question I always ask is, having a few new people coming in, mm -hmm. is that really going to change our music? Is that going to change well, our dance? Well, that's, I think that's the position I was trying to get to is that it's like a little bit of a cream and it's your black coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, Malcolm always made that, uh, that kind of comparison, that metaphor, that it begins to dilute the strength of it. But I think it's, it's so powerful, the base is so strong, so traditionally strong. I mean, we're talking about something that goes back like 110 years when you look at the well, age of the Greater Harlem Chamber of Commerce, yeah, for example. Yeah, but the, actually, <laughs> the Harlem Renaissance beginning around 1950, 1918. Exactly. That was where the culture really emerged. And as you know, much of that was supported by uh, white money, mm -hmm. who uh, Van Vechten, the photographer, and so on. And Charlotte Osgood. Mason. And then <laughs> when Harlem began to get a political base mm -hmm. and began to elect judges and assembly people, that's when Harlem began to appear to be uh, uh, politically important, mm -hmm. and then the cultural base with the uh, Savoy Ballroom, the, oh, the, yes. uh, the Apollo, mm -hmm. and all of the various things the that we know. And everything. So, sure. in one sense, it's it's a long time, you know, 80, 90 years, almost 100 years. Mm -hmm. But in another sense, if we talk about Harlem after 1965, Malcolm was assassinated in 1965. Yes. Uh, talk about Harlem after the riots in 1968, uh, there has been a struggle to maintain the culture there. Oh, indeed. Uh, it has. Even the struggle with the Apollo, if it weren't for Percy Sutton, the Apollo would not be there. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, as you said very well, it's mm -hmm. a mixed bag. It's a mixed bag because some people welcome these changes because they feel that will improve their services. Mm -hmm. Because I guess we mm -hmm. look back. I mean, one of the drudgeries I have is going to, like, the post office, for example. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the personnel there, mm -hmm. and only one or two windows are open, mm -hmm. those lines get extensively That's long. Exactly right. When you don't have, your garbage is not picked up, when the stop sign or the stoplight is not put up, put up in the neighborhood or the pothole is not fixed, mm -hmm. with all these different services that we kind of expect, expect our tax dollars to pay for when, when they're not in place, mm -hmm. you know, you worry about that. You mm -hmm. say, what kind of pressure can we put downtown? Now, we know that many of these people who are part of this here invasion, this influx of people coming in, you might say, they won't tolerate that. Mm -hmm. From a class standpoint, they won't tolerate it because they're paying more dollars now and they want those services in place. We know from the standpoint of their ethnicity that they would, they're not going to tolerate it. Well, not only that, mm -hmm. there's political power. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Harlem is in a particularly good position now as Charles B. Wrangell ah. is the chairman of the Ways oh, and Peace Committee yes. for the entire country. Ah, yeah. And so... What a celebration the, we had on that, huh? <laughs> up at uh, City College. City College. But the, the point is, it is a, a changing dynamic. Uh, as you recall, 
In the history of Harlem, we had places like Graham Court at 116th Street, mm -hmm. which were predominantly white, and they wouldn't let blacks move into there. Oh, yes. We had the houses around Mount Morris Park, which is now Mar Marcus Garvey Park, mm -hmm. where there were many, many rich people, and they lived there through the 20s. It was about in around the Depression where they began to move out, yes. and uh, they began to break the houses up. Mm -hmm. into rooming houses. Exactly. And uh, home ownership uh, by native Harlemites has never really been very great. Mm -hmm. It's getting larger now, but there was a lot of absentee ownership, and when the uh, eco economy fell in the 60s and 70s, mm -hmm. many of those landlords just walked away from those buildings. You know, and a lot, of, a lot of young pioneers, you might say, came into the community, mm -hmm. took, uh, took advantage mm -hmm. of the opportunities of some mm -hmm. of these shells that existed mm -hmm. at that. I talked about the brownstones yeah. on Sugar mm -hmm. Hill, which I know very well. And uh, so, so we had like an expansion. Of course, the neighborhood then with these the new pioneers that came in, like the middle 70s, mm -hmm. you know, I have friends who yeah. gobbled up quite a bit of property. Well, most time. of those were African American. African -Americans. The new pioneers were African American. Exactly, young, that's my point. Young professionals who wanted to be in the Harlem. The mm -hmm. one problem in Harlem still is the quality of the public schools. Oh, yes. The uh, schools in the Harlem Across community the country, Roscoe. have not, well, that's across the country, mm -hmm. but many of the middle class mm -hmm. blacks in Harlem sent their children out of Harlem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Send their children to private schools, and so they had a disproportionate number of uh, low-income children. And again, with the allocation of resources, the city didn't allocate enough resources to keep those schools strong. Mm -hmm. I understand now they're trying to develop and improve the quality of schools. And as you say, with new people coming into the community, with their political pressure, yes. things will will happen. Things I will mean, change. I mean, people want to have all of those things around them. They want mm -hmm. decent shopping, mm -hmm. you know, with that, without being price gouged to, to mm -hmm. death. They want uh, decent schools for their mm -hmm. children. I mean, no one wants to be sending their kids miles and miles away mm -hmm. to school. So you want to get that neighborhood a certain kind of... And of, of course you need uh, mm -hmm. freedom from crime, security. Oh yes, well crime is always and a concern. And of course that's mm -hmm. one of the things that has happened uh, with the increase in the size of the police department mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. they have many officers walking the streets. And there's a cultural divide there because many of the officers are, are predominantly white. Yeah, and some well. of the community <laughs> says they don't want them. But on the other hand, when things happen, they want them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's very, that's yeah. very much the case. But one of the things you, you look at it is that the old communities that I grew up in, you always had that police officer was very vitally connected mm -hmm. and knew everyone in that mm -hmm. community. But so he was certain, probably he was usually white. Right, well, even yeah. if they were white, they yeah. were like they based knew in the that community. They That's knew right. that community. Yeah. They're not coming and they in, lived in the city. One they're not the, coming in from the outside. One of the real you know. issues about the police is mm -hmm. the fact that so many do not live in the city because exactly. we don't have a residency requirement. Miles but we're away. not going to talk about that today, but that's, yeah, right, that is right. a heavy yeah, political issue. Mm -hmm. Now, you have written all kind of books. You've got The General Giant about Yusuf Latif, I remember him. Mm -hmm. You've got The Autobiography of the People. You've got Sugar Ray, mm -hmm. and you're always writing something. <laughs> of all of the books you have written, which do you cherish the most? Well, that's, uh, you know, the old adage, you know, like, which of your children do you like mm -hmm. the best? All of them are equally, I, I feel all of them, and they all, I put the same kind of energy and effort in each one of them, and I love them equally. Always the most recent ones, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of like favor them because they're in your face all mm -hmm. the time, like We Shall Overcome, mm -hmm. the Sugar Ray Robinson book. I just mm -hmm. recently finished one on James Baldwin, so mm -hmm. I imagine in a minute that'll be the one I'll embrace mm -hmm. probably more so than well, the Well, of these people you've written about, mm -hmm. who, who are the most impressive? Again, you know, you, you're faced with a problem of trying to separate some of the cultural mm -hmm. giants. You know, in Autobiography of a People and Brother Man, The Odyssey of Black Men in America, I didn't have to choose there because they had something like 158 of them. Mm -hmm. So I brought them all together to, to kind of lend their voice to various issues in this, uh, in this country that we've endured, you know, as a people and principally as black men. Uh, I think that the uh, the James Baldwin book. I'm very excited about that. That Did should be out next Baldwin? year. Did you know Baldwin? I've met him several times. Mm -hmm. Yes, you know, but I don't think I really knew him. No. I don't think I've known. A lot of people idiot. didn't know Jimmy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Yeah. I, I talked to a lot of people who gave me the information, mm -hmm. and I le I lean a lot 
on all my books. I lean on a lot of folks who actually were there. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when I write as a journalist, it's kind of like primary source material. Mm -hmm. I am an eyewitness. Mm -hmm. I've been there. So for the last 22 years at the Amsterdam News, I've been an eyewitness. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is just follow Sharpton around, mm -hmm. right? Exactly <laughs> and right. you stay on top of mm -hmm. all of the uh, issues of our, mm -hmm. in our community. So it's been that advantage mm -hmm. I've had as a journalist. And I was just thinking, reflecting on my life coming here, uh, that it's been like a pyramid mm -hmm. that at one time when I was very young, I grew up in Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, I had the energy, the capacity, the desire, the interest to kind of be the the journalist, the activist, the teacher, and the and the author. Mm -hmm. But it, it's like a pyramid. When, on the base, it's starting to narrow. So I can't teach like I used to. Mm -hmm. I can't be the activist like I used mm -hmm. to. I can't be the journalist. And all those things are kind of narrowing down to the one thing that's mm -hmm. left, and that's to be the author. Yeah, mm -hmm. So so after some 18 books, mm -hmm. I think I can really focus mm -hmm. there now and maybe give a little bit more time and concentration to those books and make them even better books. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you're from Detroit. And yes. The a um, movie about Detroit Dreamgirls. Yeah, I is, just saw it the other night. Is, uh, <laughs> up for the Academy Award. Of Eight nominations, it, but not the best picture. Mm. Um, and it had to do with the dynamics of the black music industry. Oh, yes. Just like so many cultural institutions in the black community originally were started by blacks and then were influenced by white money. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I was wondering how you felt that particular film portrayed the Detroit that you knew. Well, one of the interesting uh, little segments in there was when uh, the young man, I guess, uh, C.C. wrote the song, uh -huh. which is kind of a composite. Yeah, I mean, we're... Barry Gordy is broken up and where Jamie Foxx is one end and Keith Robinson as C.C., yeah. he has the other aspect in terms of like being the mogul yeah. and the one being the very creative, creative genius right. that he was. And he was, ex I mean, Jackie Wilson, some mm -hmm. of the songs that songs mm -hmm. that Barry Gordy wrote for, for Jackie, uh, for Jackie, uh, Jackie Wilson, mm -hmm. just amazing. So that shows his composer ability. But once he became the, the, the mogul, it was kind of like, hey, this empire that begins to grow around mm -hmm. him. And there's one segment in there after CC has written his song, you know, about the, uh, you know, the Cadillac and the car. Yeah. And then you had the white group coming in, you know, kind of doing a cover that, of it. I that see, was one of the highlights oh, of the movie. Oh, I see. That's, <laughs> what a commentary. I mean, it was an extraordinary piece of commentary in terms of what has happened, as you suggest, yeah. about this music that we generated, mm -hmm. the Otis Blackwells, yeah. you know, suddenly there's the Elvis Presley yeah. or the Pat Boons, mm -hmm. you know, or the Blue Suede Shoes, stuff like that. And suddenly here's this one little segment that kind of... Oh, this is a it, 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 of the whole it, history. It's summed was, up quite beautifully there. <laughs> that was really something else. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things about being a writer, mm -hmm. particularly when you write about people who are living, you get a chance to know the subject. You Your get a chance brother. to interact with the subject. Have you done much writing on black politicians? I know in your <laughs> news coverage you cover politics all the time, but all have you done time. much writing about black politicians, who they are, how they got to be the way they are? You know, one of the books uh, that's in proposal form right now is, uh, I call it tentatively, it's called Forever Friends. Mm -hmm. And it's the interwoven lives of uh, Percy Sutton, mm -hmm. Charles Rangel, mm -hmm. Basil Patterson, mm -hmm. and David Dinkins. Mm -hmm. That's my dream, is mm -hmm. to kind of put that book out there. Because you're talking about 50 years mm -hmm. of, of, of penetration of their lives, mm -hmm. you know, and the kind of impact and the, and the contributions that mm -hmm. they've made in this community and across the nation. Mm -hmm. I thought that would be like a fascinating book. That would be a very fascinating book. I mean, book. And, and it could tell the history of Harlem, mm -hmm. too, in a, in a fairly definitive mm -hmm. way for the last 60, 70 years, mm -hmm. certainly. If you look at the life of a Charles Rangel, mm -hmm. who grew up in the Harlem community, and as you suggested earlier, has risen to this new mm -hmm. pinnacle. I mean, just to look at the trajectory of his mm -hmm. life alone mm -hmm. would give you, but say nothing of my... Uh, my surrogate daddy, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, Percy Sutton, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, so to take it together, mm -hmm. you have something like 200, more than 250 years, you know, of polit political sagacity mm -hmm. and wisdom. I think that would be a minefield, a treasure a trove of information about Harlem and about these four men and the interwoven mm -hmm. aspects of their lives. You know, I, this is a fascinating story. Mm -hmm. However, Harlem politics was well-developed before 
or Percy and Basil and and Dave challenged some of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, J. Raymond Jones, the, the Fox, Holland Fox, the one who helped to maneuver mm -hmm. the uh, situation so they would be blacks appointed as judges. Oh yes, that's uh, true. That's a very good point. Uh, uh, Watson, Judge Watson, who was one of the first black judges. Oh, yes. So that, uh, but that that uh, has, Jack. To, that yes. has <laughs> to do with the influence of whites in. Harlem politics, mm -hmm. and now so much of Harlem politics is driven by the needs and demands of the black community, yes. and it is changing literally daily, and oh, as some okay. of these icons retire, the question is, who's going to take the next step, and what is the next step? How do we deal with some of the issues that are, that are coming up, mm -hmm. which are now as much economic as they are racial or were racial Indeed. because the racial dynamics have changed. You are talking about a black man running for president, mm -hmm. <laughs> talking about a black secretary of state and so on. Sure, yeah. um, by the way, how do you respond to the fact that some blacks, mainly conservative blacks, mm -hmm. are moving ahead in significant positions, uh, sometimes espousing positions that are not consistent with what we think uh, is good for African Americans. How do you relate to that? Well, I think that's, uh, again, you know, that's a, a long history of that. Mm -hmm. We've always had those opportunities, you know, and um, hey, I say let a thousand flowers bloom. Mm -hmm. You know, let them get in there. It's left to mm -hmm. the the opposition or the opposing individuals mm -hmm. out there who have different uh, philosophies mm -hmm. and ideologies to really put them forth in, in a very, very constructive and productive mm -hmm. way. I mean, if the, we're challenged by the notion that there are an increasing number of black Republicans out there, mm -hmm. okay, that's fine. Maybe they'll begin to offer some balance. There's an increasing number of black Republicans at the top, but yeah, right, right. 90 percent of black folks were well, the Democrats. The, I think the Lynn Swan election <laughs> in, in, in uh, Pennsylvania, as well as the Ken Blackwell election yeah. in Cincinnati, and Michael Steele down in, uh, yeah, Maryland. in Maryland, is an indication that there may not be the base there that they want. Mm -hmm. uh, Duval Patrick up in Massachusetts, Massachusetts. that was very, the very... The black man who was elected exactly, governor of Massachusetts. You know, with, within a, a fairly liberal community, mm -hmm. that being a Democrat well, you up there. Well, recall Massachusetts sent the first black senator yes, since right. the Reconstruction Ed with Ed Brooke exactly. back in 1966. That's true. So That's there true. is some... And a Republican some, was. And a Republican. <laughs> yes, yeah. Although he was light-skinned and a lot of people didn't know his mm -hmm. background. And not that he hid it, but they didn't... Know. So the, the dynamics are changing mm -hmm. in the African-American community. And Harlem is sort of the microcosm of That's how true. those mm -hmm. changes are taking place. As you look forward, how do you think Harlem will be in the next 10 or 15 years? Do a little prognostic. Yeah. You know, we were just talking about that the other day. I teach a course at City College on the history of Harlem, mm -hmm. and uh, in fact, it starts this coming Saturday. I don't know when when your show airs, but mm -hmm. there's a couple this, of other things. This I'll will air in a, a few weeks. In right. a few weeks, right. Uh, but anyway, we uh, I raised that with my students two years ago, and a couple of papers came in, and one paper, very, very enlightening paper, one young lady suggested that it'll probably look like it looked a hundred years ago if it continues at the pace it's going. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? She says, well, you remember back when Philip Payton and Pigfoot Mary came in, mm -hmm. when you had this explosion of housing, and uh, at last you had all these empty dwellings, and it was left to the genius of Philip Payton to, uh, to get with these real estate speculators and say, I, I have an answer for that. Let's bring in all of these blacks, right, at exorbitant rents. So you had an, uh, the condominiums that are going up now seems to be uh, reflecting you know what happened uh, in the last century mm -hmm. 110 years ago mm -hmm. when you had this explosion of housing and suddenly you know what, oh it reached a uh, reached a point where it was diminishing returns. The market couldn't bear it. It couldn't bear it, you know, so what are you going to so do? So what does she think is going to happen? Well, I think then you begin to reach out to these other communities to bring in, you know, to fill that mm -hmm. housing, or the prices will have to come down and make it available for mm -hmm. those people who had originally been displaced. And that's what my dream is. That's to have an it interesting like that. point, mm -hmm. but recall that one of the original black communities was in Greenwich Village, right around Bleecker Street. Oh, yeah, Manetta Lane in, and all that. Back in the 1840s. That's what it's called, Little 30s. Africa. Yeah. Yes. And Greenwich Village got to be the posh 
community mm -hmm. and still is, and getting richer. Mm -hmm. So one of the issues about Harlem, because it's so centrally located with transportation, yes, and it is so beautiful, the question is, will it ever be like it was? Uh, my thought is it'll be predominantly African American. I think so. But there'll be a lot of differences. A lot of differences be diverse. in the cultural institutions, in the businesses, mm -hmm. and in the housing and the education. Because remember, Columbia University is in Harlem. They don't want exactly. to call it Harlem. Exactly. You forget all about that Heights, But it's in Harlem. And look at that West Side plan that they have. Yeah, they have a lot of things that mm -hmm. are coming on. Mm -hmm. The other thing is very interesting. Many of our sports celebrities came out of Harlem. Yes. Uh, some of that is diminishing as the number of youth uh, diminish in Harlem. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, do you believe that some of the social service agencies, uh, like the Y and the Boys Club, will, will grow or stagnate? Or, what's your thought about that? I think, you know, as a, as a general improvement of the community occurs, that it will present those opportunities mm -hmm. for our younger people, too. Mm -hmm. Although we have a number of agencies out there. I'm just thrilled mm -hmm. at some of the, like, the Children's Zone. You know, mm -hmm. look at some of these, uh, the old mm -hmm. institutions, the PAL, some mm -hmm. of the stuff that you've been involved mm -hmm. in over the years in terms of the, uh, you know, community activities, mm -hmm. the 5K. When you, when you have in, kids who can get involved they in get involved. the music, yeah. the Harlem School of the Arts, when you look at the dance well, school of Harlem, clearly, we have our institutions. You clearly know. Herb Boyd mm -hmm. is leading some of that <laughs> cultural revolution. Uh, for those who are interested, how can they get your book? Well, uh, Human Books, you know, right in Human the Harlem. Human Bookstore in Harlem. Right in the Harlem. Right there Harlem. on Frederick Douglass Boulevard. That's right. Today on African American Ledgers, we've been talking with Herb Boyd, author, journalist, and about his work in Harlem. Thanks for being with oh, us today. Oh, it's a pleasure, Roscoe. Thank okay, you. Thank you.